Russians have started voting in their upcoming presidential election. But there's very little doubt about who will win. Oh, yes, Vladimir Putin will win the election easily. Uh, yes, uh, without a shade of a doubt, he's going to win. Not only are there no real competitors on the ballot, uh, but there are also uh, no real uh, adversaries of Vladimir Putin left. Now in Russia, a former TV journalist has been barred from challenging President Putin. Flaws in his paperwork meant his name could not appear on the ballot for next month's election. Just this morning, Russian state media is reporting Alexei Navalny has died. In the four presidential elections that Vladimir Putin has contested, no one has come close to defeating him. During his 25 years in power, Putin has surrounded himself with a wall of loyal followers that keep him in power and shield him from challenges. The system requires uh, basically one thing, unswerving loyalty to Putin, um, and second, an unwillingness to rock the boat. So how did Putin get such a tight grip on Russia? The Soviet Union has collapsed. 1991 marked the end of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has ended not with a bang, but a whimper. The Soviet Union was established after Russia had a revolution and abolished its monarchy. Then a civil war which redrew its borders, with some of Russia's closest neighbours coming under the control of this new system of government. After almost 70 years as a communist state, Russia held its first democratic election and Boris Yeltsin became its first president. We can be firmly confident Russia will be reborn. Very quickly, Russia's economy crumbled and inflation rose by 2,500% between 1992 and 1993. People's entire life savings became worthless. Nobody had the faintest idea about uh, things like inflation, unemployment, uh, uh, pyramid schemes. Uh, Russians were extremely naive. Business in the Soviet Union was owned and controlled by the government. But when it collapsed, they transitioned into a free market with privately owned companies. The way these companies were divided up, though, was a disaster. Corruption was rampant and major oil, infrastructure and energy companies fell into the hands of a few. By 1996, about half of Russia's entire economy was owned by just seven very wealthy people who became known as the oligarchs. Life in Russia at the time was hard. Organised crime, known as the mafioso, had a lot of control. It was uh, just physically unsafe for ordinary people, you know, to send their kids to school and then guessing whether well, they come back intact or uh, not. It was uh, pretty bad. In 1999, there was a poll taken of grade 10 school children in Moscow. And the question was, what, you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and eight out of 10 boys said uh, members of the mafia. And there was a real sense of gloom around Russia's prospects going forward. Boris Yeltsin quickly became very unpopular. And on the world stage, Russians saw him as an embarrassment. Yeltsin was an alcoholic. He uh, could barely function uh, in the uh, late 1990s, had quintuple bypass. There were, you know, numerous, uh, numerous videos of him um, talking to foreign leaders when he was just completely off his face. So Boris Yeltsin is the second uh, most hated and reviled uh, uh, leader in uh, Russia's modern history. With his popularity dipping, Yeltsin lent on the oligarchs to keep him in power giving them more and more political pull. But waiting in the wings was a former KGB agent hoping to be leader. Putin was working for the Soviet secret police, known as the KGB, before the Soviet Union collapsed. Years later, he described this as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. All of a sudden, millions of people he saw as Russians were stuck outside of Russian borders. It was a real tragedy for them because they experienced uh, discrimination uh, and uh, all, from all uh, sorts of oppression. They were economically disadvantaged. Putin had a swift rise to power. 
In 1994, he became deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, making connections with organized crime and the oligarchs. Then, in 1998, he was appointed as the head of the FSB, Russia's successor of the KGB. And it's here that people started to take notice. And that's an interesting role because it was widely seen by Russians as the place where the next president would be nominated. Around this time, Boris Yeltsin's public approval rating had dropped to less than 10%, with some estimates as low as 2%. With the writing on the wall, Yeltsin prepared for his departure. In 1999, Putin was appointed as prime minister, and deals were said to be struck between him and Yeltsin. So uh, Putin uh, promised Boris Yeltsin that uh, there'll be complete immunity to prosecution to Boris Yeltsin and importantly members of his family that were involved in uh, all sorts of uh, dodgy deals with the uh, oligarchs. Russia does not. During a speech on New Year's Eve of 1999, Yeltsin resigned and, per the constitution, Prime Minister Putin became president. Boris Yeltsin handed Russia's future to a shadowy former spy named Vladimir Putin. Still relatively unknown to the Russian public, President Putin wanted to prove he was a strong leader. And many believed first on his list was Chechnya. Chechnya was a region of Russia that, for much of the 1990s, wanted to be an independent state. After dozens of terrorist attacks by Chechen militants, Russia first went to war with Chechnya in 1996, but lost. Russia sustained defeat at the hands of uh, uh, rebels. Uh, Boris Yeltsin had to seek terms with the leadership of uh, Chechnya. When Putin came to power, many say he came with a plan to crush Chechnya. Within hours of Putin's appointment as acting president, he flew straight to Chechnya. In 1999, apartments in Moscow were bombed killing more than 300 people. While there is speculation about who was responsible, Putin blamed Chechen rebels, leading to the Second Chechen War. The long-awaited assault is underway. Russia won, and Putin's popularity rose. It was very much uh, part of his story, his narrative journey, if you like, um, towards embedding himself as a, as a strong man, and, and a strong man worthy of respect. Then came the oligarchs. Seeing how much political influence the oligarchs had under Yeltsin, Putin was keen to push them out. Putin frankly did a deal with the oligarchs where he said, you can continue making money, but you stay out of politics because they were, you know, in a sense, perhaps his biggest potential threat. Oligarchs that swore loyalty to Putin remained safe, while others that spoke out against him were dealt with. A banker before he bought into oil, Khodorkovsky is among the so-called oligarchs. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who openly criticised Putin, was sent to jail for 11 years for tax crime, and his major energy company was broken up. Very quickly, the oligarchs were out of politics. Finally on Putin's agenda was gaining control of the media. Uh, the laws are very often broken by the people who are supposed to enforce them. Most privately owned media companies and newsrooms were taken over by the government. Journalists within Russia that were critical of Putin found themselves at risk of jail time. And digital media wasn't free from restriction either. Putin and the Kremlin have, have fought back against that by, you know, constraining access to Twitter, trying to ensure that all Russians are on Telegram. Um, and, and getting their news from official sources. So it's estimated that still about 80% of Russians get their news from TV. While Yeltsin's Russia was about decentralization and giving more power to Russia's regions, Putin's Russia was the opposite. Russia's 89 regions were transformed into seven federal districts, each with representatives appointed by Putin himself. The government took control of the energy industry and moved the FSB under his power and expanded their responsibilities. It was all about giving more power to the Kremlin to resist any challenges it faced. It's often said that Putin's favourite word is control, which is simply control, uh, being being able to, uh, to, to be at the, the centre of decisions and being able to uh, control who knows what uh, and, uh, and who can act. 
under Putin, life has unquestionably gotten better for a majority of Russians. From 2000 to 2008, Russia's GDP grew by an average of 7% every year, while the average Russian's disposable income doubled. Putin's leadership was a stark contrast to Yeltsin. So Russians came to associate um, democracy with poverty and democracy with hardship, which is why Putin could be the strong man that, uh, that many Russians craved. Putin projects the image of a strong leader and uh, the so-called rally behind the flag effect. Throughout his reign, Putin, alongside the state-controlled media, has crafted an image that many Russians revere. But his leadership has faced its challenges. Uh, there were massive protests in Russia that uh, very nearly, uh, I won't say unseated Putin, but uh, very nearly destroyed his uh, credibility. Uh, the first one was in 2005, and the most recent one was in uh, 2018. These protests were about welfare payments in Russia, but what they showed was that Putin does have to keep Russians on his side and remain popular to stay in power. Challenges by individuals, on the other hand, are often dealt with differently. Popular and outspoken critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin shot in the back. Boris Nemtsov, gunned down just steps from the Kremlin. In 2006, Alexei Navalny started a blog where he exposed corruption in the Russian government. And throughout the 2010s, he gained popularity as an opponent to Putin. Before he was poisoned in 2020, then thrown in jail, where he died last month. Make no mistake, Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Putin is responsible. What the Russians appreciated about uh, Navalny was uh, one particular aspect of his activity, and this is his exposure of corruption. But I don't think he ever really stood the chance of, of becoming Russian leader. The most recent challenge to Putin's leadership came from his inner circle. When private military leader Yevgeny Prigozhin and his troops started driving in tanks toward Moscow to seemingly confront Putin. They weren't really opposed, you know. There were no Russian army units or very few attempted to stop them. Putin's own uh, guard didn't try and stop them. He, he really didn't seem to know how to handle this. And then again, no surprise that Prigozhin died in a mysterious plane accident fairly soon after. According to experts, it is very unlikely that Putin will lose his grip on power anytime soon. And while some people have questioned the legitimacy of the Russian elections, very few think it will have an impact on his leadership. I expect him to leave the Kremlin in a box. Putin has created a system whereby everybody below him fights for influence and fights for prestige, uh, but that Putin is, is, is the center of Russian political gravity. Ultimately, I think Putin dies in office.